Welcome to Masterminds Lessons in Leadership. We're happy to have with us today uh, Dallas Tanner, who is the president and CEO of Invitation Homes. So, Dallas, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. It very much. And what I'd like to do for those in the audience who may not be as familiar with the single family rental business, uh, I'd love to have you take a couple minutes and just uh, overview the sector. And then uh, tell us a little bit more about Invitation Homes and how it's positioned in the sector, if you would, please. Sure. Um, you know, 47 million Americans lease uh, a single family home or an apartment or something like that. And of that, about 19 million of those units are single family uh, residences. We started a company in 2012 uh, that was private equity backed at the time um, to build what basically the apartment guys had built in the seventies and eighties, which was, could you take a very fragmented mom and pop uh, ownership structure and create a best in class, single family rental uh, platform and experience. And, and so with our partners at the time being Blackstone, we built up um, what today is known as invitation homes uh, with 80, close to 85,000 single family homes across 16 markets. Uh, we took the company through a public offering. I think it was the second largest uh, re public offering uh, ever in mm -hmm. 2017. It was wildly successful. Um, and then we've continued to try to find ways to refine and make our business better over time and distance. And so today we serve roughly 250,000 Americans uh, that live in our homes. And we work really hard to try to not only create a great, you know, uh, leasing lifestyle or a leasing experience, but can we find ways to, enhance the real estate, uh, always anchoring our investment around great locations. And so the business today has um, been a, really an amazing story. Uh, and we are still just a very small part of the overall ecosystem. All of institutional ownership only represents about two and a half percent of the total single family rental landscape. Uh, and so there's, there's still a lot of opportunity for growth and, and opportunities for the industry to continue to evolve and get better. So, uh, it's been a, a very interesting um, first 10 or 11 years, uh, fraught with a lot of success and then also a lot of scrutiny. Uh, people wondering what it is that you're doing and why are you guys buying or building single family homes? And, and, and so a lot of education taking place as well. Yeah, because there's what? Only one other major public REIT in the space. And then there's one fairly large private company, Progress. And after that, you know, it's a cast of thousands, right? Yeah, it's, I think it's really hard to own more than five or 10,000 units because the scale of your platform has to be pretty uh, robust at that point. And so to your point, we've got a couple of really large players. Um, and then we've also got a number of kind of smaller to midsize operators. But you'd be surprised um, in our trade association today, there's roughly 50 companies that probably represent about 300,000 units, plus or minus. And, and mm -hmm. so, but that's 300,000 out of, you know, 18 or 19 million. So it's still only 2%. And these are the biggest companies, you know, in the country. So there's still, a, um, you know, a lot of time and distance that'll be required to have the kind of institutional or professional penetration that like multifamily enjoys today. Multifamily is about the institutional owners are about 15% of the total population uh, of apartments out there. And we're, we're only at two. So um, a lot of blue sky, hopefully, and a lot of opportunity for growth. Uh, should be in front of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and to your credit, Dallas, you're viewed to be, I think, one of the more innovative leaders in the space. Um, tell the audience about, you know, you uh, uh, made an investment in Pathway Homes, you did a JV with Pulte Homes. Tell the audience a little bit about the rationale behind some of those uh, initiatives. Sure. Well, I think, first of all, the, the marketplace and the landscape for flexibility is adapting and changing. And yeah. so as you think about, you know, what are some of these alternatives that are coming into the marketplace? And I think, uh, and why should we consider those is something that we always ask ourselves. Taking a step back, you can, you can apply the same rationale to other technologies and other sectors. 20 years ago, it was taboo to lease a car, right? Now lots of mm -hmm. people lease vehicles and they're totally mm -hmm. open about it. Nobody cares. And I think housing is pretty similar in that 
Um, forever and ever, people said, you know, the only path to wealth is home ownership. And there's no doubt that owning a home can provide, um, you know, opportunity for some of that. But there's a lot of people that prefer to, you know, invest in alternative assets or do some things differently um, that would stretch far beyond maybe just owning a traditional home. And so what we've started to understand with our customer is that about 25% of our move outs every year are people that lived with us for some set amount of time and then they were going into a home ownership opportunity. And so we found it, um, you know, very symbiotic to support programming and to find ways that we could also help the customer on that journey. Pathways is one example where, you know, a lot of our customers that can't afford to own are choosing our product because of location and they just Mm -hmm. don't have the capital for the down payment. You know, FHA and a lot of these programs do some really good work to help somebody with that first down payment on a home or to be down payment light. But after that, that people have a luck. And so if somebody wants to be in a part of the country where, you know, it's a fifty, sixty thousand dollar down payment to buy that house and they don't have that, but they're more than qualified from a, a performance and a consistency perspective, there right. should be a ton of alternative products available to them. And pathways is just one of many that have started to develop in the marketplace. The other piece of it, to your point, and so Pathways, well, we look at it as a, an equity builder program. We're a minority partner, but we think that over time, we can certainly be influential and can also add a lot of opportunities for our residents uh, with Pathways being one of many if they're choosing to go into a home ownership program. So we want to get smarter and we want to continue to innovate uh, in some of those corners. You mentioned Pulte Homes. Pulte for us is kind of a no-brainer. Like we have specifically initially not targeted being our own builder, but wanted to have the flexibility to work with a lot of builders around the country to try and establish footprints and opportunities um, versus maybe being a competitor. The other side of it is home builders have great businesses, but they can be very cyclical, right? And right, staffing right. up and having the GNA and having all that land on your balance sheet wasn't ideal for us in terms of our strategy of how we wanted to be a REIT. Um, and we wanted to be risk off from that perspective. And yeah. so far we stayed pretty true to that principle. Mm-hmm. So having strategic partners like Pulte has been super beneficial. You know, we can build five to 10,000 homes with Pulte over the next 10 years and be really balance sheet light from a risk profile, which we believe our investors like, and also mm-hmm. be under the hood early enough to where we can be influential in some of the designs, the fit and finish standards and the things you want to see in those homes. Now, going back to our customer, we have a lot of customers that would love to lease a brand new home and may Mm -hmm. want to think of it as their own home. And so I think our leasing uh, products today are typically one and two year leases, but these newer developments are going to allow us to explore some other opportunities where maybe you do longer leases, right? That are more fixed for some set period of time. And when you couple that with the builder warranty and the additional services we offer, it'll look and feel like your own single family home. Um, but you're not going to have to put $50,000 down. And so just in the same way that, you know, we'll all amortize the cost of certain things in different ways. Somebody could, that it could amortize the cost of, of being in a home far differently than having, you know, a huge down payment and a mortgage for the next 30 years. So, right. Great. Let's, let's uh, segue into your uh, earlier career and some of the uh, influencers on your leadership evolution, you know, for people who don't know in the audience, uh, you became CEO of Invitation Homes when you were 37. Is that fair? Is that yeah. right? So you've yeah. had a, to say the least, a meteoric uh, career. So kudos to you for that. But tell the audience a little bit about, you know, the fact that you grew up in Arizona. You know, you're a big supporter of Arizona State. And some people claim that very early on, uh, you were one of the true pioneers in the SFR business. Well, you know, it was – I'm an Arizona boy. I grew up in Arizona. I live in Dallas now because of the opportunity with invitation homes. But I would say, yeah, it, it was, um, I started my a company with a couple of partners in college and I bought my first couple of units while I was in college, honestly. And we were, we bought a couple of things out of, um, receivership and we moved, we cleaned them up and I moved into them and I leased them to my roommates. And this concept of like having your friends pay off your mortgage made a ton of sense to me. <laughs> it just made a ton of sense. And I was a finance undergrad because I wasn't any good at accounting and I liked the financial theory and I didn't have the patience to, you know, 
to navigate T charts and, and ledgers. And so, <laughs> so it's like real estate was like this natural love affair for me. And so I got into it and we started buying apartment buildings. We bought some manufactured housing developments and, um, we, I love the thought of being hands-on and we built our first platform treehouse communities, um, really hands-on and got to about a thousand units of manufactured housing and just the Phoenix market. And, and then fast forward to kind of the crisis of 07, eight in Phoenix, which was the worst market in the planet at the time. And we, but we, with our kind of partners started buying homes, all cash, like in 2008, um, and I was scared, Bill, like we were catching a falling knife, like candidly. Yeah. Um, but the pricing had gotten so dislocated. And because of our other ancillary businesses, we knew there was massive demand for quality housing that we thought, you know, we can buy these homes for 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars, put 15 or 20 thousand into them. And it was sad. A lot of these neighborhoods were all chain link fences with bank owned signs all over them. And we had grown up kind of around a lot of workforce folks and workforce housing. And I worked in construction and in with the trades growing up and we just, we roll up our sleeves and started buying these things and got to where we were buying a couple of homes every day. And, and that's when I bumped into the black stones of the world and some of these companies and they had real capital and loved what we were doing and had a self-contained business in Phoenix that was you know pretty successful. And they kind of positioned us as, do you guys want to go and try to do this with much larger scale? And do something that was really unique. And we looked at it as a moment in time where um, housing was needed and someone was willing to, you know, make that investment. And the world hadn't decided that we were at a bottom yet in 2011 and 12. And so that was how it started. So we were early, early innings in the space, no doubt. Um, and have always loved the idea of real estate platforms that are self-contained where you can do the operations, the leasing, you know, and all of that under one flag, so to speak, much like you know, you see in multifamily or even hospitality. Let's fast forward and, um, you know, kind of focus a little bit on today and tomorrow. How are you running the business, um, recognizing that a lot of what's ahead of us is uh, far from um, transparent? It's a great question. I mean, we, we're fortunate, back to our earlier discussion, I mean, we have a really stable business that through the pandemic performed remarkably. Now we yeah. had our share of challenge because we had a lot of customers impact. We had over 33,000 customers that we modified or adjusted lease structures and did things to help. We forgave close to $10 million in, in, uh, in rents just as a company. And, wow. um, we've, we've, we've helped, um, support residents, I think receive close to almost, I think it's in the nineties at this point in terms of rental assistance, $95 million of rental assistance. And so that, and by the way, think about that for a second. There's not very many companies that have the resources to be able to help residents, right? Do all some of yeah, those types of yeah. things. So, you know, the flip side and the narrative is, is people, you know, nobody's going to give you credit for that. But the reality is, is like to be able to help 250,000 people navigate a pandemic, I hats off to our team. It was unbelievable amount of work still is, and we're still working and helping folks, but, um, there's uncertain times ahead, no doubt, with where the geo and the macros go. I'll, let's talk internally, then we'll talk externally. Internally, what do we do with our current business? Internally, we're in the right markets. We're in the highest growing markets in the country, largely what we call the smile. Southwest, Southeast, Sunbelt. These markets are experiencing almost two times the household formation and growth that U.S. generally is experiencing. So we've got wow. tailwinds there in terms of where household formation is occurring and where jobs are happening and where people are candidly relocating. So current business, offer great service, be flexible with your customers and try to figure out how to drive down costs for them in mm -hmm. other categories in their life that have nothing to do with leasing a home. So the cost, I call it the Costco effect. How can we look at things like insurance, landscaping, all these other things that you and I spend money on, regardless of mm -hmm. a mortgage or a lease payment. And can we use our Costco effect, so to speak, and our scale to drive down costs so that a leasing experience with invitation homes feels far different than how they would lease from maybe a mom and pop landlord. And we're doing that. So this year we'll do roughly close to $45 million of ancillary revenue on a run rate basis. Whereas three years ago, Bill, that number was zero. So at a, you know, at a 25 times multiple as a public company, that's pretty powerful stuff. That's a billion dollar yeah. business right there. Just at what wow. we currently have. So the question then becomes, 
How do we make that a two or three hundred million dollar a year business? And by the way, it's very capital light once you get it structured and set up right. Mm -hmm. And they have long going rebates where the customer can take that privilege or that experience that they got with Imitation Homes with them to the other parts of their life going if they want to. And just Mm -hmm. have that be an ancillary benefit to having been in our kind of bread of business over time. That's the stuff that gets me really fired up. And I think that's how you navigate some of the uncertainties going forward is you've got to have a value proposition that's far better than what your competitors are offering. And we certainly have to use our scale and the infrastructure and the resources here to leverage that experience for the customer. And then I think you also have to be honest with yourself. Like, I think we're pretty good. We're not perfect. So you got to survey the heck out of your folks and the people coming in and out of the portfolio to figure out what can we do better? And are there things that we can do that can actually enhance that experience or lend itself to a better, you know, Google and Yelp rating from your customers or the things you can do, um, you know, that, that thrive in those environments. And we're entrepreneurs. We want to figure out how to do it better. Mm -hmm. the, The external side of it is how do you think about growth and where can you take measured risk in appropriate ways? Being a public company, as you know, our cost of capital can vacillate based on the latest headline. You yeah. know, Russia invades Ukraine. Stock comes down seven or eight bucks. Uh, mortgage rates go 75 bips higher. Stock comes down a couple of bucks. We put out great earnings growth. Stock goes up, right? And so, like, yeah. that cost yeah. of capital is really funny in the public space because it doesn't lend itself always to immediate capital if you need it, if you see an opportunity. So we've done a good job of managing balance sheet growth, what I would call public company growth, by taking advantage of our spots where we can raise capital and grow. And we have very little debt, right? Like our net de- our debt to income ratios, our net debt to EBITDA is inside six times, which was a goal from 11 times at our IPO, which we got hammered about because we were over levered because we were coming from the private space. And so over the last five years, we've done a good job of getting our balance sheet to an investment grade rating. But I don't want to be held out of the marketplace if we can go build, buy, or develop really good product. Um, and so we've started a, a couple of years ago building out our JV and our investment management business with yeah. great partners. We've done a couple of ventures with Rock Point. Um, there's lots of capital that would like exposure to our business. And so I think you'll see us kind of weigh that balance. And I think so the internal side, batten down the hatches, make sure we understand the customer, make sure that we're staying full. We haven't lived in an environment where – you know, rents have been your friend. The tailwinds for rents have been insane the last couple of years. Um, right. And it's not anything we're doing or not doing. It's just having great real estate in the right parts of the country. And mm-hmm. then the flip side of that is, you know, how do you think about that growth and how do you pick spots and stuff we talked about earlier around Pulte Homes, partnerships and pathways and and just being smart. I mean, we've been at about 80,000 homes for almost almost five years. It's not that we've been mm-hmm. growing our home count. Because we sell homes back into the marketplace every year. It, we would love to grow, but we, we're really measured about it. And we want to we fine-tune the portfolio versus necessarily being the biggest in the world, right? Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that lends itself to better performance and helps you kind of hedge some of the macros. But we have very little debt. We have a, we have a, a customer that continues to want to renew. Um, and about a third of the country always leases something. It's always been that way. Homeownership rates have been between about 62 and 68%. No matter how you look at it over the last 40 years, today we're at 65 and some change. And so about a third of the country always leases. And so in the four lease business, there's going to be interest. You just got to be, you just got to have the right company, the right product, the right people, right services. Mm -hmm. If somebody was to ask you, you know, who was, who was your greatest mentor or greatest mentors? Who, who, Who stands out for you from a leadership perspective? Well, there's certainly people that you go to for, uh, help, right? And just working out your thoughts out loud when you face. And I was really blessed to grow up in a family with a dad who was very entrepreneurial, has built some great companies. Um, huh. So having him as a resource has been fantastic. But I, there's a couple of mentors I've had kind of along the way that have been really, really supportive. A couple of business leaders in Arizona that um, some of our early family offices we were raising money from. Uh, in and around Arizona, one of the big tractor family uh, that that runs all the Caterpillar businesses in Arizona, a guy by the name of Jeff Whiteman has been a real role model um, and helped me kind of think through my thoughts, uh, him and his partners um, at an early age, because I've always been entrepreneurial and I've never really worked for anyone. That's kind of the weird thing about me, Bill. If I'm being fair, 
<laughs> I started a company in college. It's weird, but anyway. Well, but I'm just saying, like, I, I, yeah. I've never taken a job out of school or something like that. I started a company in college, we built it up, and then I did a deal with the lar- largest private equity firm in the world. And so I went to work for John Gray right from there. So, you know, watching John in the room in our board meetings was like, yeah. you know, watching Michelangelo probably paint in terms of business. The guy's so smart. All his team is really smart. And he, they're just thinking three and four moves ahead of how to, you know, how to think about, you know, solving tactical challenges, but doing it in a team environment. And so, you know, some of that I hope has rubbed off on me personally. Um, I've had amazing mentors at Invitation Homes with both Bryce Blair and Mike Facitelli, my two chairs yeah. that I've gotten yeah. to work with. And some of the CEOs that were in the business before me, John Bartling, these guys all had different um, – styles and my everybody look at me as being a, probably a hair more cavalier but my styles i believe is very authentic um and i think what i've always figured out i'm not the smartest guy in the room but i think you can get people to carry bigger loads if they believe in the mission and they know that it's coming from an authentic place so mm-hmm. if you don't love what you're doing get out of what you're doing that's that's the message because nobody wants to go to battle with somebody that doesn't really believe in what they're doing. And I love housing. I always have. I, for some weird reason in college, I started buying units and I started really finding the passion. It's, it's a lot easier assets. I should have gotten into office or, or retail or hospitality. They're easier to buy and trade and there's less, it's fraught with less of the social dynamic, but housing is such a fun thing to be involved with. The stories are, are a little bit more, you know, feel good. And, and so you just learn a lot from some of these guys that you've been around and gals um, you know, Janice Sears on my board has been super influential. Some of my thinking, uh, she's done, uh, she's been really remarkable. We have, we have a couple of really great women on our board today and in Heidi Roizen and, and Jana Barbe Cohen, they're, they're just different perspectives, different viewpoints. Right. And so, um, yeah, you just, you get good advice when you're, when you're young and green and I still feel like I'm young and green, but I've got some war wounds over 20 years. I feel, I've learned a, hopefully a few things along the way. Um, but well, the biggest lesson that I learned probably early on was when we signed our deal with Blackstone, I called my dad and I just said, I said, Hey, you're not going to believe this, but we just signed a term sheet for three and a half billion dollars of debt and equity. And his <laughs> well, only thing he said, and you know, that was after we'd raised maybe like $75 million in Phoenix, right. <laughs> for, for housing. And yeah. his comment to me, uh, I was walking, I was in New York. I was on the phone. He was checking in to see how I was doing and, I'm 29 at the time or, or 30 at the time. Yeah. And I said, he just said, act like you've been there before. That was his only advice. <laughs> just like, you know, act like you've been there before. Like, you know, just do it, just go figure it out. And so, um, I've, I think I've just continued to use that as like a, a false sense of confidence. Just keep going, yeah. just keep doing what you're doing. And everybody's full of firsts. We all have our first, right? We all have these first moments and what yep. you do it, you know, you can do it. Yeah, we all do for sure. So I'm sure they're gonna. There are a lot of um, entrepreneurs in the audience who are going to be watching this uh, podcast for sure. What's your What's your advice to uh, entrepreneurs relative to uh, what's going to make some successful and some not so successful? Well, I think, and, and I'm talking about myself here. When I was really young, I, I would overstress: Am I making the right move early on? And I think we all have a tendency to do that. And I think. Yeah, you know, having been involved in a lot of different businesses at this point, 20 years in, there's no one right move and you need a lot of luck and you need some timing. So it's, you can't control that. But what you can control is putting yourself in positions where the luck can happen, the timing can happen and things can come together. But that only happens if you're willing to like really roll up your sleeves and crank and really, you know, surround yourself with people that are like-minded. If you're focused on only making money, Good luck because you're going to chase the wrong motive, honestly. And you'll go down a path that isn't as pure or feels as good to you. Uh, my, my experience set, and I plan on applying this over the next 30 years of my career, is I want to do things that make me happy. And I want to do things that like actually bring me some joy. And it's not just the product or the, the mission. It's the kind of people you're spending your time with. Because it gets a heck of a lot easier to focus on problem solving. And by the way, they will get thrown at you. I deal with a lot of crap that's unfair and has nothing to do with what we're trying to focus on. 
But mm-hmm. you want you want to be armored with people that you care about that are also as focused on the right things authentically as you feel you are. And so if I'm an entrepreneur today and I'm going through school, don't be afraid to do things that, that you know, listen, I bought mobile home parks. There's nothing sexy about mobile home parks. Like I was in parks collecting rent at 1030 at night in scary parts of town, but I was learning how property management from the bottom to the top works. <laughs> and, you know, it looks really cool to run invitation homes 20 years later. But the reality is like, I, you have to cut your teeth doing things that are uncomfortable a lot in life and, 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 you know, learning the kind of what to do and what not to do and how to think about value it really impacted my decision making and I hope my leadership styles today. And then I also think people want to see that you'll get messy with them. And so mm-hmm. if you're an entrepreneur and you want to build businesses, you can be just the idea guy, but good luck. I think you also got to be willing to, you know, go take phone calls and knock doors and learn some things along the way. And so I, I just think that's the advice is I wouldn't overstress on whether you're making all the right decisions early. I would just continue to put yourself in the right decisions. And then somebody else asked me this question once when I was talking to, I was up doing a lecture at Brigham Young University. And I I think one thing I regret from college and from my earliest kind of, you know, forming stages, I spent too much time with people that were just like me and friends and stuff, right? Like people that you got along with. And I wish more than anything in like that from 18 to 23 or 24, 25, I would have put myself out there more to spend more time with folks that maybe had different viewpoints or thought about the world differently, or just were intellectually curious about different things instead of, you know, only going to football games and and I'd have no regrets, but I wish I would have signed up for debate or gone to lectures that were different from things that I was necessarily totally interested in just to get more perspective early. Cause I think that would have guided some of my principles and maybe even some of my entrepreneurial ambition in a different way earlier. Yeah. Well, you know, Dallas, you use a great word, authentic. And I know how hard you work and that's critically important to your success, but the whole issue of being authentic and walking the talk, um, I mean, my experience in dealing with all the leaders that I dealt with over my life, there's nothing that can supplant that. Um, for, totally. uh, for sure. So, well, to, to, to wrap up the conversation, you know, I've got three pillars of leadership and one is around this whole issue of generosity. Um, and, you know, I'm interested to have you share, you know, with the audience, you know, you're involved with a lot of philanthropic initiatives. Um, but I'd love to have you just talk about a couple of them that are meaningful to you and, uh, and why they're meaningful to you. Well, there's, there's, I mean, I've spent time serving out two years. I was a missionary over in Europe when I was 19. I did two years of that. So growing up, I was taught that you just have to be involved. Um, but there's, there's probably two different platforms right now. I'm really passionate about one I've been involved with for a long, long time, uh, almost 20 years. And the other really I've gotten reengaged in the last few years. So the first one is, a, a um, a uh, charity that we're involved with. I wouldn't say we run it, but we're definitely extremely supportive called American Indian services, AIS and a gentleman by the name of Dale Tingey, who has done more for native Americans in this country than I'll ever, I'll, I'll ever know somebody who has, uh, they have put thousands and thousands of kids, uh, that come from reservations around the country, uh, into a matching program for college uh, and it's really cool what they do. Um, they, they come into these schools now almost at the K through six level and help make the students aware of some of these programs. And then they, they help them from kind of early in high school on to know where to apply and what different, you know, grants are available to Native Americans. And then they also, we, we raise a bunch of money and we donate a lot of money ourselves to match dollar for dollar those grants. And typically you can almost cover all of tuition and board by do, by taking that approach. Um, and it's a really cool teach a man to fish approach because if you maintain above a certain threshold on the GPA, we stay with them through all four years and even any master certification they want to do. And at this point, I think the numbers are close to like 10,000 students from the reservations that have gotten, cause they don't have a lot of hope in some of these parts right. of the country. Right. And we help get them into all, I mean, hundreds of different universities, community colleges, junior colleges. And then they take a lot of that experience back to the reservation to help their people 
it's just been phenomenal to be involved with. And Del Tingy and his team are salt of the earth in terms of quality of people. They commit their whole lives to helping Native Americans. So that's one. And then the how second did, how is did you get involved um, with, with them. Just out of curiosity, was this something your family? My dad, did or honestly, or? yeah, our family got really involved. We we knew Dale. Uh, they started this program back in the seventies, and we've just been super supportive. In fact, we're hosting an event in Montana in two weeks where we typically raise about one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars every summer that goes into this program, and then we do things across some different markets as well. But they raise several millions of dollars every year, and. And it's just it's a fantastic program. And, and the cool the coolest part about it is when you are a member of the pro, when you get the the help, then you mentor new students down the road. So yeah, it's just it's just a self fulfilling prophecy in terms of how people get help and then help others. And it's just it's, it's fantastic. And then yeah. the second one I'm involved with, as you know, is um, I went through the the inaugural class. Well, I had already started Trials Communities. And ASU, Arizona State, was doing its inaugural class for a master's in real estate development. And I'd stayed somewhat close to the program and, and a little bit of my story the last, say, 10, 15 years. But I, a couple of years ago, um, with it, and I can't take all the credit, but Greg Bogle and a few other folks with ULI, I don't know if you know Greg, Land Advisors, mm -hmm. he's fantastic. Yeah. We just got really passionate and locked ourselves in a room and said, how do we help Arizona State really put the real estate program on the map in a way that could be meaningful? And so... Now we're working with um, Dr. Khan and, and a number of people, uh, Chris Howard, who you know, has been supportive, yeah. uh, and a number of people at Arizona State. And we've raised, uh, in the last year, I think we've raised close to about $2 million to kind of seed a new campaign to really help not the only the undergraduate program there in the studies, but to, to start to build out a master's program, and then ultimately a center of real estate, hopefully, um, to where we can start to really put uh, so much in real estate happens out of Arizona. It's always been an amazing market for um, real estate development. And if you think about the SFR industry, Colony, Invitation Homes, um, a number of companies were birthed out of that Phoenix market. And the whole prop tech space, I mean, OfferPad, Open Door, all these prop tech companies have all started in Phoenix. It's just, it's this melting bed of innovation around residential. So we just, we want to help. And Arizona State's been awesome to me. And so... That's another area that I'm spending a little bit of time and some resources on right now to try to see if we can really start to get some momentum down there in the valley. Is your mom still alive or, or just your, your dad? Both? Yeah, okay. both my parents. If I was to call them and just ask them what they are most proud of about you, what, what do you think they'd say? <laughs> I don't know. You might get a loaded answer. Uh, I would say... Look, I, I think they would say that I, I have kept kind of I've kept my principles uh, intact. You know, I'm married. I have five kids. Um, life's never perfect, and it always looks perfect from the outside. But like, we just keep our heads down and we keep going. And um, I, I think you know, I always say that, and I've been lucky. Like, I've been really blessed. Like, I've had great mentors that you talked about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. I have an amazing wife. My wife has been extremely supportive of all my entrepreneurial anxiety over the years. And right. uh, I, I would hope that my parents would say that he did it his way and he didn't lose his way along the way. Right. And, and so <laughs> cool. uh, I, I think that that's probably my story. I don't think I'm the smartest guy in the room, uh, but I'm not afraid to you know get in the room. Yeah. And I think if you do things, uh, you, you touched on it again at the end, like authenticity matters. Like, do things your way. Otherwise, why are you doing it? And you can yeah. have all the money in the world, all the success in the world. But if you look back and you thought, oh, I was just a puppet. I just did it everybody else's way. You're not going to look back and be like, that was that was awesome. And so, and sometimes yeah. you got to conform. I've learned that too. Trust me. Yeah. I've had to fit in a box yeah. a little bit to some degree. But I hope they would appreciate that I haven't lost my way along the way. Yeah. Well, Dallas, this has been great. Thank you. I mean, you know, this is truly inspirational to a lot of people who are going to watch this and, and really understand who you are and what you've accomplished. So I very much appreciate it. And, um, uh, you know, just uh, kudos to all you've done and you got a long runway ahead, buddy. So I'm excited to see what's, uh, what's ahead of you for sure. So thank you very much. Thank you. You guys have been so supportive and uh, it's great to be with you, Bill, and appreciate everything you're doing for people that are trying to get into real estate. So thank you for yep. that. Absolutely.